Hello, thank you for inviting me to present uh, at this wonderful online event. The title of my presentation is, if it's all about the data, what about the people? My name is George Crooks. I'm the chief executive of the uh, National Innovation Centre for Digital Health and Care uh, in Scotland. Our role is to address the societal challenges that Scotland is experiencing uh, across the health and care sector using digital tools and services appropriately and therefore address um, those challenges but equally importantly create economic advantage for Scotland and the UK by creating opportunities for Scottish businesses to develop next generation tools and services to serve the needs of our citizens, but also to create opportunities for inward investment. And I and my organization are always on the lookout for like-minded organizations to collaborate with, because as everyone who's attending this event knows, it's a tough world out there, uh, particularly in health and care at this moment in time, and finding people who understand uh, that services are not sustainable in the medium, let alone into the long term, um, are important um, because it's only by working together can we make life better uh, for our citizens and for health and care systems, not just in the UK or Europe, but around the globe. So my presentation is going to challenge uh, some of your thinking, I hope, uh, and give you some food for thought along the way. This is our world. Communities and technologies are getting smarter. Digital tools and services are ubiquitous to the way we run our day-to-day -day life. But for those of us practicing uh, health or care, wherever you are, when you step into your work environment, you often set the clock back five, 10, maybe even 15 years in the way our organizations use technology and in some cases even uh, how they understand technology. And that is how all my presentations have started for the last two years until 2020 when along came coronavirus. Coronavirus has turned our world literally upside down in all sorts of ways. And we're seeing innovation accelerate at a pace that has rarely been seen uh, in the last hundred years. But there are worries in that because what is happening is people are patting themselves on the back and congratulating themselves that their healthcare organization is moving forward at pace. Look and see what we've done. We are using uh, teleconsulting uh, on a scale that's never been seen before. And they believe that is innovation. But in fact, as you guys know, uh, we're deploying 20 plus year old technology um, and it's taken 20 years for us to adopt it into business as usual activities. So what we're going to talk about is the next generation of services. But how do we do that? When every news broadcast, when every politician talks, they talk about the demands and challenges on our hospital systems. This is the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow. Glasgow is the hotspot of COVID-19 disease in Scotland at the moment. And never a news broadcast goes by um, about, unless they talk about the number of beds occupied by COVID-19 patients, the pressures on intensive care units. And these are all real and pressing and challenging issues which we need to address. We also talked about care homes, the challenges of the uh, care of our residents, both physical and their mental health and well-being, as most care homes are now isolated and um, to try to stop the virus entering the care homes. And that's causing stress for the residents and distress uh, for the families of the uh, residents uh, in these institutions. But again, we're talking about institutions. We're not talking about people. And now things over the last seven to 10 days are moving on to vaccination and how vaccination will be here in the near future. And we'll be talking about how we implement a national and international rollout of vaccination to those vulnerable groups, both healthcare workers 
and the elderly in our society. And that is going to consume uh, all our waking thoughts uh, over the next three, four, five, six or so months. So that's a challenge for us. But let's look on the bright side. We all live in communities. We need to talk about communities. We need to talk about community resilience. We need to talk about how we in digital health and care can create tools and services that allow us to live in our communities safely and effectively through this global pandemic, but into the longer term. What is life going to be like for our children and our children's children as we move into a new world? And as I said at the start of this, it's all about people. But let's have an injection of reality. Let's look at some of the facts. Up until January of 2020, I used to say that um, the delivery of health and care services wasn't going to be um, possible into the medium and long term the way we're delivering care today because the percentage of GDP being consumed by health and care is increasing inexorably. And also uh, the fact that demand and capacity challenges are getting ever more clear and present. But now with coronavirus and the challenges it's putting on top of those long-term and institutional problems um, is the issue that our services are not sustainable today, let alone in the medium term. And then if you add into the mix, the one subject we are really not talking about as much as we should, and that is the world's challenges with climate change and our government's targets to achieve net zero within the next 30 to 50 uh, plus years. Climate change is going to be a greater challenge for global public health than the coronavirus ever will be. And we need to make sure we sort that out. And healthcare around the world generates about six to 10% um, of global CO2 emissions. Less than 5% in African countries, just slightly over 10% in the US and round about 6, 5, 6% um, in Europe. So there's something we can do about it. We know that the main contributors to climate change are travel um, and the supply chains for health and care, particularly the supply chains into our health and care institutions. At the moment, we spend most of our money on treatment. We need to shift that balance to focus more on prevention, detection and anticipation and on independent living and much less on intervention. That's better for us as individuals, as citizens, but also for our CO2 footprint and also um, for financial sustainability. And I would suggest to you that the way we can do that is really to think digitally. But it's not about technology. Just because we can use technology doesn't mean we should. But sadly, we keep trying to press things as far as they will go. But the global tech companies have recognized that. And it is possible, as you can see, um, in the life cycle and design of mobile phones, they got smaller and smaller as technology improved, particularly battery technology, but also you could min miniaturize um, the internal workings. When people realized, hold on a minute, this device is almost becoming unusable for people. And now our mobile phones are getting bigger again because we need a bigger screen size because the user experience is what it's all about. What does that tell us? Once again, it's all about people. But what I would say in this context, it's all about you as an individual and me. And what if we changed our thinking and we stop investing millions of euros or dollars or pounds sterling in technology that is there to serve the organizations that deliver healthcare or the people that work in them. And we stop thinking about services that have to be provided in a way um, that uh, invests time and effort in simply joining up disparate siloed systems at the back end of our systems. And we look to the future. What should that look like? Well, we look around the world and we have determined 
that the way forward is to look at the citizen. What if the citizen became the point of data integration? What if we stopped putting artificial intelligence in the hands of governments, global tech companies, and healthcare organizations, and we allowed citizens to store their own data in a personal data store, and we gave them access to artificial intelligence to work on their behalf, on their own data, to allow them to make better informed health and well-being choices, to allow them to access services on their own terms. We can reduce the cost of health and care, we can improve the health and well-being of our citizens, we can reduce CO2 outputs, and we can make a better world. So how do we do that? Well, the, one of the mantras, apart from you're on mute, um, is looking at population health. This slide will be familiar to a lot of you. Well, certainly the inner part of the pie chart will. This is the social determinants of health and what it demonstrates that, that your health and well-being and mine are influenced only to about 20% uh, by the actions of our formal health and care system. The vast majority of our health status is determined by our individual behaviour, what we eat, uh, how we exercise or not, whether we smoke, how much we drink, those types of things, 10% our physical environment, the housing we live in, but 40% is about our social and economic environment. But then if you extrapolate to the outer ring, and this is not scientific, but this is work that we've done in the DHI, my organisation, looking at the data points that we can collect about people over the past five, six years, we found that the healthcare system in whatever country you're in is making decisions on you and I and our children based on the data it trusts. And the only data that a healthcare system trusts is the data it pr produces itself. And that's about 16% of the available data. If you look at the rest of the outside of the wheel, Personal data is about 17%, 8% uh, we can collect from uh, our home and technologies in our home. And there are data points around about our social and economic environment uh, from our uh, store loyalty cards uh, and so on and so forth. You can, you can work these things out. But what it means if we can blend citizen generated data with formal health and care data within an ICT architecture and environment where they, that data can be trusted, it can move about seamlessly and securely in a fully consent driven way. How empowering that would be. So what is our future? I think I've just articulated one version of what it should look like. We should stop talking about products, but we should start talking about services. As soon as we talk about products, we can have the best technology in the world, but if the service wraparound isn't right, it's not going to serve us well. So when we talk about next generation products, we're talking about data sharing. We're talking about building an ICT architecture for the future that allows data to flow seamlessly in a way that we as citizens flow seamlessly through our health and care services, through our public services, and through our day-to-day -day lives. Because if we can understand the lived experience of us as individuals, as you as a patient, we can actually make better informed health and care planning decisions but more importantly, better informed management decisions, and that will serve us all well. So what we're suggesting we think about is how can we bring the Industry 4.0 toolkit into the health and care space? We have built an ICT architecture that allows this to happen. It's based around a data exchange layer that is consumer facing linked to a personal data store and into back-end health and care systems. And we've linked a number of products to that. Some established things that you would expect us to do, blood pressure, coughs, falls, detectors, uh, algorithms that can uh, express risk uh, and suggest uh, clinical uh, interventions that are appropriate. But equally, it's linked to uh, Google 
Fit and Apple Health Kit. So any consumer device that links into those can also link into your data exchange and we can move that into the electronic health records within a healthcare jurisdiction and we can take data out from these back-end databases into your bed, be your personal data store. And we can empower things. Now we were using this as a simulation environment, but what we have done now is that we have based Scotland's digital architecture um, to cope with the uh, COVID challenges um, on that environment. And now it is live and it is running a number of clinical services. And I'm not going to go into the detail of those just now because all I want to do is to challenge your thinking. So what will the world be like when we say the citizen becomes the point of data integration? And we're in a world where a number of data exchanges are sitting there to allow our data to flow seamlessly and securely. An ICT architecture is built by regions and nations that allow fully compliant, consent-driven decision-making by you and I, who can see our data, who can work on our data on our behalf and how that data can flow into back-end government systems, uh, health insurers, NHS systems in the UK or other health and care systems around the world in a way that allows that data to be trusted and to be used in clinical health and care provision. So we need to understand that. And people at this conference have got some of the answers we have got some of the ideas and you who are listening to me will also have some of the solutions. And we need to understand how we glue all those things together into a coherent offering. So events like this are important. They are the catalysts for conversations, catalysts for conversations that need to keep happening. So I would encourage you that you use these events to make connections. You use events like this to make contact with myself and my organization and like-minded people, and we can see if there are synergies for us to work together. Our environment is there to be used to test theories, to test thinking, to move the argument forward. And we are moving from industry 4.0 to health 4.0, but beyond that, health 4.0 says the hospital is a factory and we're going to optimize pathways to drive efficiency. That's a simplistic view. Our world needs to be care 4.0, where the person, the citizen is that point of integration. We use technology to build communities, to deliver co-managed care, to empower individuals to take more responsibility for their health and well-being and the delivery of their own care. And we do that using the tricks and tools that global tech companies have been using for years to keep us loyal to their products. And that is personalization. But personalization, recognizing that the healthcare world is complex and we have to celebrate and plan for the management of that complexity by creating flexibility in how we deliver services. Because it's all about the citizen accessing care on their own terms, in a way that suits them, in a way that benefits them, in a way that they can actually participate. They can be not only the actor, but also the director. I just want to leave you with that thought and thank you very much indeed. That's my presentation concluded. <laughs>